Hey, welcome back in, everybody, to the next edition of the JB and Steel Shows. We're here to recap a wild field goal ruled weekend and then a wild game in a different aspect last evening in the Chiefs and Bills game uh, when it came to that game. We're here to recap the NFL weekend, and we're here to talk about the NHL and AHL checking in on teams. And if we have time at the end, we'll try to talk a little bit of some basketball for you as well. But first and foremost, Steel, how are you doing on this Monday at the end of January here? Yeah, man, this is like the next to last Monday in January here. And I'll tell you what, man, um, after the divisional round of the playoffs for the NFL, uh, I'm stoked. I'm excited. I got to watch some good football this past weekend. I'm doing great, man. How are you doing, buddy? Doing well, doing well. Um, some two people that were not doing too well, um, expect, well, one person in terms of getting hit, um, but another person in terms of just making – not making the right plays and making mistakes were Ryan Tannehill and then Burrow in terms of getting hit. He still had the good numbers, but he got sacked nine times. You would prefer not to get sacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not to get sacked nine times in the game, and there's not many times you get sacked nine times in a game and win. And win. That's exactly right. What the Bengals were able to do um, because their defense stepped up, which it's not like their defense is bad. Their defense is solid, but their defense is not – to the degree of how we would rank some of the other defenses that were in the playoffs, so like the Bills, the Chiefs, the their defense is a very good defense, though. But like, but okay, like they uh, stepped up big time in that game where Tennessee's thing is winning off a of running and defense. The Bengals, um, basically in that game, were able to pass it to Jamar, pass it through T, have a uh, Joe Mixon do good in both the categories of receiving and rushing, and then just figure it out because that was a very defensive game and that's not really the type of game I expected the Bengals to necessarily be able to win in the postseason but they did and with the worst part happening Burrow getting sacked nine times so that spells good success for them going forward and was a surprise aspect for me of that game because I didn't expect them to be able to find multitudes of different ways to get to a victory but they did so right I was completely expecting them to win uh for sure to be honest with you okay um <clears throat> you picked the them to why win, I, but my thing is i wouldn't have picked them to win as much if i knew it was such a low scoring defensive game because that plays to the tight end strength it, it does but let me just say this okay let me say this <clears throat> um yeah joe burrow got so- sacked nine times but this year they had a thousand yard receiver this year they had a thousand yard rusher this year they had a whether it would be whether it's middle of the road defense and statistics and some there was like one or two categories where they were in the top 10 but other than that for the most part they were you know in in the teens area for defense all around defense okay mm-hmm. so when you have an all around defense that's pretty good with occasional here's and there's which is what happened Right. And you have a very balanced attack running and passing with a mobile run threat quarterback. Okay. That gives the Cincinnati Bengals a completely different aspect of of where they used to be compared to where they are now. And now they can they can stand now a little bit more with the Tennessee Titans, with the Pittsburgh Steelers, with the, with the uh, Baltimore Ravens, with the Buffalo bills and the chiefs and, and, and handle that kind of game to where if it's going to be a slug fest, okay, they can do that because they can grind the ball out. They can run the ball very, very, very effectively. Okay. So they can grind clock. And and they can and they can get first downs with the run game and and they don't you, you don't need to pass Joe Burrow could just be under center the whole freaking game and just hand it off to Dixon and what there you go you know what I'm saying that's all the offense they really need because their offensive line is that good their receivers block downfield you, you, you see what I'm saying well, I wouldn't say the Bengals offensive line is that good well another- but. That's the only point. Uh, the, the other stuff you were saying, I, I do see what you're saying. They are a team that they have more stuff to be reckoned with than they did in the past. Most I definitely. would still say their offensive line is the worst in the postseason. I would agree with you on that 100%, but they got a running back who can make a lot out of a little. 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Joe Mixon's a running back that, similar to, like, it didn't matter what offensive line and Adrian Peterson was running by. If you or Ladanian had, Tomlinson, it didn't yeah, matter. Just, yeah, yeah if, you know. if, you're, if you're just that dude, you're going to figure out a way to find the gap and be able to exactly. make the offensive line look better if you're that good of a running exactly. back. I mean, so, well, just Gail Sayers would say, 18 inches is all I need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, so 18 that team, inches, though, man, that that's team, only like that. Game, though, when it came to people that had, like, the Higgins, the uh, Chases, the Mix because then the Titans would stop them when push came to snub uh, in the red zone or towards the red zone, and then it would become McPherson's day to shine, yeah. what it became in the end, since then okay. McPherson, the rookie kicker, uh, won the game and basically went out there and said, oh, I guess we're going to the NFC cha- or the AFC championship or something like that to Joe Burrow while walking onto the uh, field before he even kicked the football. So, you know, that dude That's has, sick, right? That dude has a confident... Um, so he was probably, I would say, honestly, just because of how much he factored in. Burrow's obviously a player of the game, but if you were doing it like hockey, one through three stars, you probably have to put the first star as the kicker because of how much he was a factor in the I game mean, and won the and, game. And, and, and yeah, also his... Burrow, because he went off, he just didn't have a touchdown, but a 348 yard. Uh, and then you have Higgins and Chase and Mixon kind of as the three musketeers grouped into one there would all be the other story. That See, that's the thing. That's that's what makes Cincinnati a dangerous team because they have that balanced offense attack. Yes, their offensive line is not the best, but it's good enough and they have a good enough running back. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter any of their running backs. OK, it's not just Mixon. Right. So it doesn't matter. Any of their running backs get get cracks and get creases and get holes in that. You know what I mean? Because he's still getting sacked a lot. So that does tell you that mm-hmm. it's, their offensive line is not the best, but he's also mobile enough to well, get out of those situations, to make the best of a situation, to extend the play. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, my conclusion for that game before we move on to 49ers Packers would be more Burrow is just that good. What we saw him in his rookie season before he got injured, they had a worse overall. Well, one, they didn't even have uh, Jamar, but they had a worse overall offensive line. Now they have Chase and everything's moving in the right direction and they're looking better. But that's the thing I would say that in the offseason, they have the most focus on view, whether it's via the draft sure. or whether it's via for the, sure. uh, the uh, free agent market. But now we can move on into – the uh, San Francisco 49ers, where Jimmy Garoppolo continues to get bailed out for mediocre play, um, as the San Francisco 49ers defense uh, prevails again, and they're able to um, win this game, as well as not just their defense, um, but the block punt return for a touchdown was the only touchdown their special teams, which was not a strength of the 49ers throughout the regular season, yeah, right. steps up in tenfold in the postseason. And they get a block to then even make it tied. Aaron Rodgers, the whole team of the Packers, looks completely flustered after that. Can't get anything going on the next drive. And then they're able to, of course, get the Robbie Gold uh, 45-yard field goal to add to the field goal frenzy of of the weekend to win it there after Cross earlier in the fourth quarter. Uh, hit a field goal of his own, and Gold also hit one in the third quarter. So there was a lot of field goals in that second half to go, along with the theme of field goal. In, in, in this game, games. But, um, I mean, this game was obviously even more so than the Titans game was a complete defensive ruled game. I mean, 19-16 is still a little bit better offensively than 13-10. I mean, talk about yeah. Talk about a game that's all defensive or, or special team rules. But they do say def- – so my question to you would be this, because they do say defense wins championships when it comes to – the, the expression, it's defense wins championships, and then the rest of the stuff you have is, is great and an added bonus. My <clears> thing <throat> is with Garoppolo, though, and the liability he can be at times, usually the way, the reason they have him is he's not, a, he's a guy that holds onto the ball for the most part, and they don't want a gunslinger because they win by their defense and running their football effectively. If you have a guy that gunslings and it turns it over, you're going to lose because you're putting your defense on the field too much. But if he makes passes like he did forcing that one in the first half, when he tried to turn into basically Mahomes or something, I don't know what he was thinking, and then threw it and threw an interception. Uh, you you can't do that, and that and he doesn't. Oh, and then the week before he made a throw to the outside. I can't remember who it was too, but yeah. he missed the guy. So he has plays that he loses you the game as much as he has plays that he at least holds on to the ball to give you a chance to win it. It's not usually usually you're talking Garoppolo, right? Yeah, usually 
you don't win the game as the 49ers because of Jimmy G. It's just because he did enough to not make you lose the game, basically. So defense wins championships. But my the long way of phrasing that question to you is, do you think the 49ers have a chance because of the fact that Jimmy Garoppolo is the guy at the helm compared to the rest of the quarterbacks that are left, which are obviously top 10 guys in the league, most likely in most people's eyes, where Jimmy G's not, not even close to that? I'm actually surprised, um, to be honest with you, that the 49ers won that game because I saw throws from Garoppolo that I almost thought were interceptions. I, I mean, there were probably four throws that he made that I thought were interceptions, and amazingly, the the receiver caught the ball. The guy does not know how to either a lead his receivers correctly or put them in in a more of um keep them going in stride to catch the ball kind of a thing where guys have to constantly come back for his balls because they're always low and down you know what i mean i saw so many of those balls that he threw during that game that were low and down so do defense wins championships well let me say this the best defense against, say, somebody like Tom Brady is to keep him off the field. Mm-hmm. So the best defense against Patrick Mahomes is to keep him off the field. Apparently, because all he needs is 13 seconds. Yeah. But, but I mean, you, you see what I mean? So do defense wins championships? You betcha all day long. If you do not have a good stout defense that can stop a team in the red zone on the road once or twice a game. It doesn't have to be every single time, but you need those stops. You need to have that consistency in your defense because teams are going to be able to spread you out and test you and do things that you haven't seen. So you see what I'm saying? So, and and as, as the defense, you're always on your, you're always on your back heel because you have no clue what the offensive guy is going to do. I mm-hmm. mean, you can study tape and tendencies and all that other stuff, but that guy might be running a, a, a Z route and you're thinking he's going to be running a, a, a Y route or whatever. You, you know what I mean? So it's like, that's the, that's why defense wins championships. That's why <clears throat> when you get a team like, that we've seen in these divisional playoffs now where these defenses now are that good or maybe the offenses are that much better yeah. is what is what I think is going to be the case here in some of these other things. You see what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. yes, to answer your question, defense does win championships, not just in football. I also think it works in, in, in hockey as well, too. Okay, I also think it wells in soccer to an extent as well, too, because if you don't have a good goaltender in hockey or in soccer, I don't care how many goals you score if the other team just keeps scoring back on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But I I mean, I think the reason I phrase that question is with the 49ers, they don't have the second thing, though. They don't. Necessarily, which is they they can run the ball, but if you need to make a key pass on third down, every other quarterback, I'm more confident in doing that with. Even if Ryan Tannehill was still in the playoffs, I would be much more uh, confident yeah. in him completing the third down pass. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with you 100% on that one. Garoppolo. So, like, that's the big issue I have. That's why I wouldn't uh, rank the 49ers much high. But I would say, obviously, the players of this game were just the overall 49ers defense and their special team. And then Played. Debo, Elijah Mitchell, like they tend to do often, uh, showed up Played. in their own right. Again Very well. much so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they carried over. But now, um, we can go before we go to a uh, different crazy game. This game was nuts in its own right because the Rams decided to almost pull an Atlanta Falcons Super Bowl and let Tom Brady come all the way back in the second half due to their turnover issues. But like- they got a good lead in the first. Mack A got a field goal. Blanton, of all people, scored on a touchdown flip. I know. And then Sucka answered with a field goal. Cooper Cup had a beautiful uh, oh pass for Max Stafford in the second quarter to score. Um, and then Stafford rushed up the middle in the third, and then in between that, there was a field goal by Gay. Um, Leonard Fournette also, I was surprised how solid he actually looked in this game for being his first game back and probably still being banged up because it was rumored all week. Like, yeah. not rumored, but felt like, is he even playing? Like, when's Leonard Fournette? Right. Yeah, they were going to monitor. Yeah. 
his the fact his that reps. He was back makes you think he was still going through something and just working it through to be there yeah. for, for the team. So that's a high praise in itself. But then, um, I mean, th- this game, the only reason I think Brady had a better second half, I said it in the recap I did on my channel. I still don't think he played an overall great game. He no, got he handed opportunities in the second half because of fumbles. Uh, by Akers, and then Cooper Cup obviously made up for it in tenfold because he went all ballistic in the game and made two key catches in the final drive. But he also had a fumble, of course, too. So you had key turnovers that were the only reason, in my eyes, honestly, if those didn't happen, they're squashed, and I don't think Tampa Bay's even having a chance to come back in this game because their offense was stalled when it started at normal field position. It was you gave them turnovers and you gave them great opportunity and they took advantage. And Tom Brady, one of the greatest of all time, is always going to take advantage of opportunity. If you give him that opportunity, even in a game he's not playing that well and the team's not playing that well and the offensive line stinks because Tristan Wirtz is out. So, like, he's still, if you give him those opportunities, he's still going to take advantage of it. And, and, and here we go again where you ask that question, do defense wins championships? Well... I mean, let's face it, uh, the Rams were up 27 to 3 at one point, right? And it wasn't looking good for Tampa Bay at all. It was not looking good at Tampa Bay for all at all, right? But Tampa Bay has a pretty good defense. Agreed, yeah. Okay, and they got Tom Brady. Now, here's the thing about Tampa Bay, and this is why I believe that they they did come back, but I think they may they they probably fell a little bit short because they didn't have enough guys to spread around to get the ball to to help them no, get yeah, Gronk and Mike Evans, Leonard Fournette. Yeah. That's it, right? Okay, you were you're down a bunch of receivers. You're either due to injury or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're down receivers, and you only have a select few cup, couple of guys. And and let's face it, the Rams defense is no slouch defense at all. No, and I think their defense overall played well. The only reason it looks like they didn't by the score of it is because of the offense. They gave well, them, and the turnovers. Gave, no, that's what I mean. It's oh, yeah, of, yeah, okay. No, yeah. I bet because of the Rams offense in the second yeah, half. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. defense didn't look as good because they kept giving the ball and great opportunities to Tom Brady. So I mean, like, that's never going to be a good <laughs> recipe to have. Yeah, no, when defense. you give him the short field, he's usually yeah. going to capitalize on that's that. That's never going to be a good recipe for your defense having success. No, no. <laughs> how how to make your defense lose championships is to Just give the ball to Tom Brady. You know, right? Exactly. But they still won that game, and it's because Stafford showed, which he's been even with the Lions, where he didn't have the weapons like he has here. He's always been a good last drive quarterback, and he showed that again. And a duo that I would say was probably the best in the NFL this season in Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford. Go at it again, and he makes the great route. Cup runs to the outside of the field, catches the football, then runs another great deep route, and then they obviously are able to get the ball down, and they have seconds left on the clock, and then they're able to kick it in. And then Matt Gay uh, becomes the hero of this game, um, just as McPherson became the hero of the uh, Bengals game. So, um, I mean, it, it's nice to see uh, the kickers that, that, that get to celebrate um, it, it on this weekend. Uh, did yeah. for a change, uh, yeah. and and um and the kickers get to be the, uh just like um Evan McPherson, uh get to be the and Robbie Gold get to be the first stars of the game, and then you have the defense and special teams with San Francisco, yeah. uh, the Bengals we talked about uh, Burrow Higgins Chase and Mixon, yeah. uh, et cetera. Where with the Rams, uh y- you get to talk about Matt Gay coming up big. He made a couple other field goals throughout the game, had the game winning field goal, and then the other players of the game. Beckham continued to have a good connection, a good chemistry. He's just going there with Stafford. He had six grabs, I believe, if I remember correctly. The stats, he's yeah, here it is, six. He has six catches. So um, that, that's technology for you. Stuff doesn't always load quickly. But um, And then Cooper Cup almost had 200 yards. So, I, I mean, th- th- this team, I think, honestly, will be – this is going to be a spoiler to the thing we get back to after we talk hockey, but will be representing the – um a- nfc but 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 we'll get we'll get we'll get back to that um in, in some due time uh here's the thing that kind of blew me away was the fact that in spite of everything in spite of the rams giving up basically 24 unanswered points to have mm-hmm. buccaneers tie them 
Okay, that's basically what happened with all the turnovers and everything like that, and 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 all that kind of stuff. That that's basically what happened. Okay, so I mean, it's once again a kicker coming to the fore. Um, I got a great opportunity to watch Robbie Gould kick at Penn State all four okay, years. I will go now. Yeah. Okay, and the fact that he's still gunning it. Well, he's still kicking leg. He's still got leg to kick like that, right? Because th- th- his his field goals were no slouch field goals. No, yeah, yeah. Robbie, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> forty five I mean, yard field goal is not a slouch field goal. He's been good his entire career. He's one of the best playoff kickers of all time by percentages and everything. So if exactly. you get if you get him to have an opportunity in the postseason, more often than not, he's probably exactly. going to um, make a big uh, play for you. I I think that Matthew Stafford finally, finally is answering the critics. Yeah, which he also all he had, if you really think about it, most of the time in in, um, what's it called in Detroit was Calvin while Calvin was there as a Hall of Famer. But 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 you can't just throw to Calvin. Never had he never had a defense. (laughs) Yeah, he's running for his life most of the time. You, you know what I mean? So it's like it's it's like good, good gravy. I mean, that, gosh, imagine if you get. I mean, all he did in college was win. All, yeah, all he, and he usually still figured out a way, other than in recent years before he left. But they were really nothing at that point to make the I mean. Lions relevant when mm-hmm. they were really not that much mm-hmm. of a team. Where in recent years you couldn't do much because they were just uh, really. Irrelevant. A lot of people looked at that move and went, wait a minute, Matthew Stafford to for, for Jared Goff? And like, oh, man, Rams got the short end of the stick on that one. Well, who's laughing now? Yeah, and I didn't even think that when they made the move because Stafford's a better – I like Goff a lot when he came out of the draft. I don't like him that much anymore because he's – now no, not as a dude, but as a player. I mean, he's, he's a manager. He, he's a game manager. He, but yeah, but Stafford that, is going to yeah, throw the ball for you. He's going to be yeah, the Yeah, Stafford's guy. a guy that can gun to sling it. But also, at the end of this season, he had a problem with picks. He threw seven in, like, the last – I know. Say, like, eight weeks. But, like – Normally, he hasn't had those same issues. And I think the reason we saw that go up this year is because he takes more chances due to the people he has at his disposal. So you're good. At, that's just a natural increase more to me than it is a heavy, I agree. A heavy concern. Yeah, you no, I agree. You have OPJ and you have Cooper Cup and you have Higby, uh, the Higbys of the world. You're going to um, air the ball out. And then earlier in the season, you have Robert Woods. You're going to space it out and, be, and and take a few more chances. Exactly. Sometimes. Exactly. So. But, sure. but with this team, the reason I'm so happy with what they've been able to do with Stafford and everybody is they, they committed not just in the offseason, but during the season, bringing in the Von Millers of the world, getting OBJ after he was set to the Yeah, like, like so, oh, yeah. Yeah, they committed, and it's coming to fruition right now. Man. So it's nice to see that. We're for the Bengals, I forgot to mention this. We're talking about them, so I'll mention this before we go to the last game, which was, of course, the crazy Bills and Chiefs. But for the Bengals, it's great to see them. They're ahead of the race because they don't have that uh, offensive line yet. They don't have a filled out. They have a good defense, but there's still things that need to be completed on their defense. And they're already here. They're already got this far because of Burrow and the ridiculous offense. They have the defense stepped up in moments they needed to throughout the season and in that game. Exactly. So they, exactly. they're ahead of the ball game where that's why it's great to see that for them, where for the Rams it's great to see because they committed so much to trying to get a Super Bowl and finally get to it and get one, and it seems like they're in a good spot to be able to exactly. do so. Exactly. But on to the last game. Yeah, on to the last game, which was by far one of the uh, craziest. We had a good first drive that ended with, well, we, first of all, there was two four-down conversions and multiple ones by the Bills throughout the night where they were aggressive and it worked pretty much every single time. And then they were able to get a touchdown from Singletary. Then, of course, Mahomes had the very good uh, diving scramble uh, touchdown after that one. And then it was Pringle. And then it was Gabriel Davis, who made his uh, himself very well known to the NFL world in this game. What a coming out game that was. Yeah. Then Buckner had a kick. McCall Hardman uh, rushed to the end zone. Gabriel Davis had another key touchdown in the third. Yeah. Um, and Tyree had Kill had a great game. Yeah, so, I mean, Gabriel Davis for four touchdowns, even in a losing effort, the way that dude went off because they decided to say, we're not having Stefan Diggs beat us. We're letting anyone else beat us. They basically took the approach of this is not the guy that's beating us. And if anyone else beats us, so be it. 
that's what the Chiefs looked like, the approach they were taking. Yeah. And Gabriel Davis took advantage of that and was able to get four touchdowns. That's why sometimes I do that in my hockey videos, too. Even in a losing effort, I would still put him close to first, and then if not first, as the second star, because he's the main reason the Bill, other than Josh Allen, he's the main reason the okay. Bill's been there, because the, your other guys, did. Dawson Knox, who's supposed to be a very good tight end, he had that one nice catch he fought towards getting to the first down, but other than that, he did nothing. So like, And Singletary, yeah. at the beginning of the game, did nothing. So you literally just had Gabriel Davis step up this entire game with jo- along with Josh, Josh Allen. Allen. Yeah, that because he was their leading rusher for, for this first yeah. half. Mm-hmm. And that's why I also think the Bills lost because their de- – excuse me, not their defense. Their offense became two-dimensional where you, usually they have other stuff that they're able to space the ball to the Nazis of the world. They're able to get to the diggers of the world. They're able to run it a little bit better, mixing their backs in with Singletary and, and others. But they did. They lost that dimension that they just had, and it worked because Allen's such a good quarterback, and Davis exploited the fact that they were focusing on digs. But I think they would have had a better chance to win this game if they were able to find another dimension as well, because that they they kept going to the same well and it kept working. But obviously, they might have been able to take a jump and been up a little bit sooner and took a little bit of a jump start and maybe been able to uh, pull away a little bit if they had a, that extra dimension and like say Dawson Knox stepped up and had a big game for like 85 yards uh, as well as Gabriel Davis doing well, that adds a whole new dimension, especially when it's a tight end, because that adds a different degree of guarding them. Uh, yeah. New dimension to the team. I think the fact that I, that's why I'm putting Gabe Davis and Allen still as players of the game, because they both figured it out when everything else was taken away. Uh, I'm going to say this uh, uh, about the, this game here. Number one, um, amazing game by Davis for the Bills. Um, that was just amazing to see that kind of a, of a performance out of him. Um, let me say this. If the Bills would have stayed running the ball, they would have been successful because they were successful running the ball when they did. You like using the running back, not using Allen. Okay. And they were good at doing the play action pass because it was working against Kansas City. Because let's face it, Kansas City doesn't have exactly the most stout defense out there. I mean, they have a really good defense, but it's not like a shutdown defense. Like you're you're like, oh, you're going up against Kansas City. Oh, that's going to be a low scoring game. No. You know what I mean? No, yeah. They have a right? defense that picks at spots that steps up at times. Uh, that's what I mean. They bend but don't break, but kind of one mm-hmm. of those kinds of things. You know what I mean? So so this is kind of where I'm at with this. All right. Um, the Bills beat the New England Patriots to get to this point. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they took a huge step this year, I believe, the Bills did. It's unfortunate Especially that they – Especially in terms of the division. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And – Josh Allen also, I believe, made a huge statement in this game, okay? It is unfortunate the way the rules are, and that's the way it is, and it's that's the way it's been, and I'm sorry, it, it stinks, but it, that's the way it is, you know what I mean? And if you would have done a little bit more during the game, maybe there wouldn't have been that little bit at the end there where it was back and forth, where, like, if you said if they would have – or maybe if they would have stayed with the running game a little bit more and and mixed into the passing and done more of the play action, action too. That's yeah. what I, yeah they could have they could have won the game that way because they had Kansas City on their heels that way, but they chose not to do that. They chose to be exactly what you said, two dimensional, where they were only throwing it to Davis and Josh Allen was their leading rusher. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, and I mean, I think the Bills, uh, like you said, is a good step in the right direction. This this matchup has been named last year. We saw Dig staring onto the field. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to have the uh, revenge this year. But like, the, we this shows this is going to become a rivalry most likely for years to come until the Chargers, because Herbert's that dude at QB two or even have to around them that can get them to the promised land. This is going to be the rivalry. That is in the AFC. You're going to have the Chiefs and the Bills, I think, for at least one more year. I could see this being another matchup in next year's playoffs. And then the Chargers, one example, might start 
coming up. And the Raiders have some foundation pieces. It's just what are they doing quarterback-wise? What are they doing with their defense and, and all that? that uh, and Tennessee, you can't, can't fa- got to factor you in Tennessee. Yeah, you can't count out Tennessee, but are they keeping Tannehill? Are they moving? Is this the time to move on from the where? What are they doing in the future? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. obviously, it's tough to predict now. But I would say these two teams, because most things are set in stone, and the big things are they're going to have their two guys at the top at the exactly. position next year. They're going to be the rival that we see. But in terms of stars, Allen and Mahomes are both stars of this game. Uh, Pat was able to get it done, obviously, at the end. And then Harrison Buckley, who got the announcer jinx earlier on to have him miss some field goals, was able to come up big in the end uh, to, to win the game um, for the Kansas City Chiefs. But before we go on to previewing uh, the next week of NFL games, I figured because the NFL is what everybody's – really itching about now we'll go into hockey next and go into uh, everyone else's other favorite sport at least at the seal flyers group and we'll talk about that and then come back to previewing next week because then we can kind of end on the football note okay that sounds good but when it comes to overall uh play we can start because this will be a lot quicker we, I said we'll do a couple – talk about a couple how good AHL teams are doing, and I wanted to make sure we included that because Lance, of course, when I was on the show, brought up how I wanted no blah to be a coach option. They're still doing great. Uh, Hartford's still in – well, technically second, but by points they would be first because Providence has uh, – um, what's it called? The win percentage because they only play 31 games. Right. So, they're, they're in second, even though they have more. So players. I watched them the other night, the Hartford. Uh, well, I watched that, the Hartford. Yeah. And they were on TV. Yeah. The, was it the NHL network game? Yeah. Yeah. They usually, they always have that AHL game. That's a cool thing they started doing, putting different AHL teams on. Okay. NHL. I've been watching them. I, when they put a game on, I usually try to watch it. Half you of the time, I mean? it's kind of like when I have. Um, ESPN on. I'm so used to going on the apps that half of the time I just end up watching them on the app, and then I'm like, oh, I could have just watched that on TV. I mean, but you know, because I don't even pay attention to the TV <laughs> schedule that much, unless if I'm on NHL Network for something else, and then I go, oh, I'll watch that on NHL Network instead of having yeah. to go on my Fire Stick or go on Roku or whatever. Like, well, see, now you 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 bring up the ESPN, or you bring up ESPN, right? And they got all the games listed there, and it's like. You get to watch in one game and you forget that you can go to a whole bunch of other games. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So like there's there's multiple games going on and you can yeah. you can just go back to either game and you just totally forget. Like you get engrossed in one game. You know, and well, like, they also oh, don't oh. have the split screen. Like if you have no, MLB, if you have MLB TV, you can split your. Oh, screen see, screen. that's unfair, man. So you can have a game here, and then you can have another one here, and then you can oh, have a four unfair. screen. But okay. but a four screen is kind of pretty small because then it's just yeah. square boxes. Uh, well, um, it looks like care. those like cameras, basically, when you have like the security cameras and has the four boxes to show you the four different cameras you have. It looks like really small um, boxes, but. I got you. Um, when it comes to the AHL, when it comes to the Atlantic Division, uh, the, the teams that would be in the playoffs right now would be Providence in one. So the Bruins, this goes to show with the AHL, it doesn't always correlate to how high your farm system's ranked. It correlates to how well you're coached and how good you just have AHL veterans on your team and guys yeah. in the middle rounds that just figure out a way to become scrappy at the AHL and then get a chance. Like Oscar Steen, for example. The, the Bruins thought many other prospects were going to pan out. And now Oscar Steen comes up and is making actually a positive name for himself at the NHL level because he's already good at the AHL level. And he gets that opportunity now because other guys didn't make a – Stunika didn't step up and others. They just did they, – they, they came up and just didn't hit the mark on the head. So he got an opportunity and he got developed very nicely with Providence. Yeah. And uh, he got a chance to come up. So – um, the third team that I usually expect to be successful at, and uh, yeah, Hartford, yeah. Hartford uh, is very successful, but Hartford uh, works in the other. The, the, the Rangers obviously have a great ranked prospect system, also have good veterans on the, on that team. So that one does work with that uh, factual. But you don't. it shows that obviously being well coached, having a great system and just having very good players can get it done. You don't necessarily need the top form system to compete. For the, it helps, but you don't need it to necessarily compete for the Calder playoffs. Because if you have a great coach and you have a great system, uh, you're going to be able to figure it out most of the time. 
And if you have players that can meet that system, that can do the things that you need them to do in that system, play 200 foot responsible, get the right things done, five on five power play, special teams, blah, 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 you know, the whole nine yards, goaltending, all that, all that factors in, you know what I mean? So I do want to also make a quick little shout out that over this past weekend, the Hershey Bears did the teddy bear toss. Yeah, they broke the record. Yeah, I was just going to say, so the, they, they broke the record with number of teddy bears that were thrown onto the ice. Um, and just uh, watching that is just amazing to, to, to see all those teddy bears go flying and then watching some of the players who are skating around and then jumping into the piles of, of the teddy bears, right? So mm-hmm. I, I did did want to shout out to the, the Hershey Bears. That's a great, great charity. Uh, they, they do uh, – uh, a teddy bear toss and uh, they broke the record uh, which was what over what was it uh 50,000 yeah 50,000 50, or something like that like the old record was in the 30s or something right yeah it wasn't even close yeah that's like seven to depending <laughs> where it was the 50k that's like six to eight bears per person uh, yeah right so it was like with 30, the way that was the old record went to that stadium yeah but when it comes to the bruins though providence um, they have, I think it's Ryan Mongenal's, uh, I might've pronounced his name wrong, but his first season as the head coach, he was an assistant. So he's working his way up the, um, ranking ladders of people that are going to become no names. If, uh, he keeps doing that well yeah, Hartford, yeah. with Chris Noble, like I said, is doing really well. Springfield, the blues team, they would be in the playoffs right now. Uh, Hershey that we just mentioned for breaking the record, they would be in the postseason right now. Charlotte would be in the postseason right now, who has the split squad between the Panthers and being Seattle until the yeah. team uh, comes in next year. And then you have Lehigh, believe it or not, would be the final team in, wow. the, Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic playoffs with Bridgeport and Wilkes-Barre Scranton um, missing the uh, playoffs uh, with the six seed. Lehigh Valley would be the final spot in the North. Uh, Utica's came a little bit down to earth, but they're still a great team at 22, five and four have some of the most ridiculous, uh, talent and scoring, uh, on that team. Do you uh, know there's Apple a Apple certain team. player on that team? I believe. Who the Comets? Utica. Um, who are you talking about? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about oh. it off air. We'll talk about it all fair. Oh, 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 okay. That's all right. I think there's a player on that team, but we'll get to that. I, I'm not sure, but I want to make sure. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, but yeah, no, they have a very good overall team. Obviously, you have Holtz as a young guy. Nate Schnarr has been very good in his uh, Zetterloon, no one foot. they all been good in their young careers down there. Um, so they also have the goaltending with uh, Kira Schmid and Nico Dole. So uh, if you have the defense, they have a good defense with Nikita Hoduk, who's a pretty big dude, uh, Grillo, who's a big dude. Tyler Watherspoon's a good veteran. Uh, so they have a good mix. and they're able Good to mix get, of players on there, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So them, uh, Rochester, who's Buffalo's system, uh, Toronto, Laval Rockets, Syracuse, and the Cleveland Monsters would be the teams in the north. That would uh, round out the playoffs there since they're doing the top six teams uh, because of COVID. In the central, it would be the Chicago Wolves, who are always consistently good. We talked about them before on the show with how they have the big bucks because of the way their ownerships work out. Uh, Manitoba, yeah. Grand Rapids, who just picked up Justin Abdelkader, actually, former NHL. Oh, owner. my. Um, and they're, they're third. Um, the, the Rockford Ice Hogs are fourth. The Wild of Iowa are fifth. And then the Milwaukee Admirals are six, so that would round out the playoffs with the Texas Stars being a, a, a obsolete out of the team. They have 26 points. They would have to really go on a run. Um, they are. They have only played 30 games, but they haven't been playing that good hockey this year uh, down there yeah. in terms of being a playoff team. They're 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 a, just sometimes scrappy, competitive, almost like Seattle Kraken in AHL. Got you. But, so they're not going to make it, I don't think. How many games are they going to play this year? They're supposed to play the full, I believe it's a 76 game schedule. I always forget because right. there's, there's, there's different numbers for each league. The yeah. NHL is 82, the ECHL is supposed to be 72, and then the AHL is something else. Uh, but it, yeah, but, no, no, I know. I know. Yeah, I was just checking so, if they were going to uh, play a full season or not. It might have even still been 82, but it depends if they're able to get it in. Like the ECHL, for example, which we'll talk more about ECHL teams next week. I wanted to do AHL this week. 
the ECHL started changing at the points percentage where Reading wasn't first, but then because of games at hand, they moved to second. Uh, similarly to how Hartford's in second, even though they have more points than Providence because of points percentage. So they changed the points percentage, which makes people think that's them saying we're not going to get everybody to the same amount of games. So we just need to, if we can't make up everything, we just need to have it the most fair that it's not going by points. Yeah, okay, I got you. Okay. So, we, yeah, we started doing that with uh, our our top five teams, top power ranking teams we do on Off the Wall Hockey on, right. on uh, Friday nights at 8 o'clock on uh, John from Off the Wall Hockey. Uh, our top five teams, our power ranking teams are all based off of this points percentage. Yeah, because it makes more sense in theory because points – um, well, you got guys, you got teams that have played 43 exactly. games and you got a, a team that's only played 36 games. Well, that's why they did it in the ECHO. Cause it's only fair. Cause you, it, it, it's not the fairest thing. Cause obviously you have a better chance of having a higher percentage in less games. If you're successful, then you, then you have more chances, even if you're a good team to lose. In yeah, a, but still, <laughs> but, but, but it's still more fair than the points thing. Yeah. There's never a perfectly fair thing, especially when you don't have everybody play the even amount exactly. of games, but to wrap it up and then move into the NHL before we uh, go back to football. Um, we have the Stockton heat who are one of the best teams in the league at 23 wins Ontario rain, the Kings team, the Stockton heat or the um, flames. Um, and then you have the Colorado Eagles, the Henderson Silver Knights, the Bakersfield Condors, and the Abbotsford Canucks who make up the top uh, six there. Although the San Diego Goals, the, 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 that 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 one, all all the bottom three teams at 28, 27, 29 points. It's 32, 34 points for the five and six seed. They're actually all still in it in that division. So that division is a pretty close division um, in terms of the final playoff spot from top nice. to bottom. So that'll wrap up um, our quick glance over the AHL as now we're going to the NHL before we um, get into wrapping up predicting some of the NFL games for next week. Of course, in the East, the Florida Panthers are still killing it, rocking and rolling. Uh, one of the best plus. I think they're still the best plus minus team in hockey. Yeah, they are still the the best. Well, not plus minus, but plus team in hockey at a plus 48. Uh, differential. Uh, yeah, a differential team in hockey. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Colorado's nipping at the heels at 47. Yeah, Colorado's right behind them. So you have them, Tampa, the Battle of Florida, as we said in the past podcast, is going to go to the Battle of the Death of Florida to the end of the season. Uh, then we have Toronto, who's still hanging on uh, to be behind them in the Atlantic. Then with the Metro, we have the New York Rangers, who have been a very successful team, but still ahead of the pack team. They're kind of like the Bengals of hockey that we, we thought they would be good this year, but they're stepping to where we probably thought they would be next year or the year after, which is one of the better teams in the league. We thought it was going to take a year or two longer, I think, for that to take foretold. But it yeah, is, but you know what, though, Joe? I'll tell you what, though, man, well, especially with the Rangers, I think it's – I really believe that their additions in the offseason, and I also really believe in, in Shesterkin. I think he has really helped – and then with Panarin and the way Fox has been playing, the way Chris Kreider has been playing, I mean, there's a lot of guys on New York right now that have just really kind of and come together. Here are actually starting to play like the the skill because they always looked fine. It's just they didn't produce. Now exactly, they're starting yeah, but to get now they're starting to yeah because they're starting to get it. You know what I mean? You know. What I mean? So, so but, like I said. Uh, so, but New York coming coming out and being one of the better teams, you know what I mean. That that's that's where it's at, um, right right up there with uh, you know the Pittsburghs and the Washingtons and 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 you know uh, those yeah. types of teams. So I mean, I, I, I'm really it's impressed right with this second. top. Yeah, I'm really impressed with what the Rangers have done. Um, also, very much impressed with what Florida has been doing. Um, we've talked before at length on Florida. Um, I'm still very much impressed with Carolina and Colorado. Um, I've been watching a lot of those Colorado games, a lot of those Carolina games, a lot of those Florida games. You know what I mean? Trying to catch them. And then Minnesota. You start looking at the teams from out west, and you look at Minnesota, and you start looking at that and going, wow, all right. And then, hey, what, what's going on here? You know what I mean? So – been quite impressive with some of the teams out west too especially like the california teams anaheim's and la's yeah, all three of those teams have been the impressive because you have a 47 point tie 
uh, the winning percentage goes to the Kings of a 560 to 547 uh, between the Kings and, eight, and not the Angels, the uh, Ducks. And Whoa. Then, <laughs> yeah, and then you have the San Jose Sharks are three points behind I'm at 44. The Sharks man. are doing it interestingly because the Sharks are just finding some days they score a bunch of goals, when other days they barely score a win. They, because like you wouldn't yeah. like that's why they have that minus 16 because they're so inconsistent compared to other teams in the playoffs. They all are in the uh, positive when it comes to differential because the Sharks win in mysterious ways. They'll have one week that they're scoring in bunches. The next week, they're a defensive team. The next week, they're getting out. They lose two games because they get outscored by a bunch, and then they come back and win the next two, scoring seven goals in each. So it's like they're a weird they're a weird team to, to ballpark, but they do have Carlson playing his best hockey in a while. Couture looks amazing this year. Myers doing his thing. Hurdle's a beast as a goal scorer. So you definitely have the right pieces. It's just funny how that team's winning compared to the other California teams. They look more well-rounded and, and more technically sound as a whole, where the Sharks look like sometimes they're just throwing things at a dartboard and going, well, we could probably try this to come well, back. Well, well <laughs> you know, I mean, they have 131 goals against, and that's like some of the worst in the league. Exactly. But they're still one of the more successful teams this far because of the perseverance they're not that much above 500 but like they're still in the playoffs and they and they if they go on a run similar to how we've seen the minnesotas the the, the and others go on runs so they can fl- they can flip that though yeah i'm with but, you but they it's, it's impressive in itself that they found a way to even be this successful with that negative i now check this out right they are seven seven and three at home they are seven seven three away so that's at least consistency, at least. <laughs> but to go right? over, though, the rest of since we stopped at the Rangers, you have Pittsburgh, Carolina, then you have Washington and Boston to round out the wild card um, there uh, for the East. Uh, I mean, I think we, we, we've we been right. I know I said it coming into the season, and Pirlo, once I said it, said that's a fair point when it comes to these teams. With Boston, with the Washingtons, with Pittsburgh, until they lose the for Pittsburgh, it's the Crosby's, the Latangs. Uh, the Malkins of the world, even if you lose Malkin next year, you saw Crosby and Tank, until they lose those guys, I'm not counting them out because there's always a will way factor with Doesn't those guys. Doesn't even matter if they Bergeron, lose those guys. With Bergeron and, um, well, for the playoffs, it would. I don't see the, I don't true. see the Penguins making the playoffs. Okay, yeah, true, yeah, for the playoffs. That, yeah. That's what I meant for the playoffs. Okay, okay, yeah, all right. And then when it comes to Boston, it, until you get rid of, like if Bergeron, Pasternak, all those guys are still there, they're gonna pro- they're gonna find a wall and a way most of the time, and this is not the most complete Boston team first through fourth line by any stretch. But they're still yeah, figuring it out. Uh, Washington they brought in good additions like the Daniel Sprongs of the world that are having the best seasons with them. Uh, as, as long as you have a Vetchkin, the Backstroms of the world, Carlson, and you have that goaltending tandem, you, you're going to be in a good spot there. So that we were right with even those teams being more veteran than others and people exactly. To out. They actually did stay in the postseason, and you're right, Colorado became Colorado again because of injuries and COVID. They were a little roller coastery early and now they're the avalanche again. And yeah. you have St. Louis continuing to do their thing, coached by one of the best in Barubi. Nashville starting to do better on both ends. Their differential starting to teeter up. So uh, they also have obviously one of the better impressive goalies in UC Soros and have right. Askarov up the plate too. So right. uh, if you have goaltending, you have solid defense and you're pushing the offense. Bet the best we've seen in a while with Duchesne and Johansson, you're definitely going to have a chance to make it. <laughs> I'll and, say. <laughs> and then you have Minnesota and San Jose is the wild card. Vegas, LA, and Anaheim uh, make up the Pacific. So yeah, that, that that rounds out how the playoffs would be right now, where Dallas, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Winnipeg are all within four points of that final spot, some less. I'm with you, and I'm I'm pulling for Calgary to get in. I'm I'm pulling because man, they really showed out at the beginning of the year, and they've they've dropped off significantly. But I, I'm kind of pulling for Calgary to get in a little bit. I'm hoping for the, for that. Calgary has a more because, like I said, the Sharks win based off of whatever they figure out. That now Calgary is a more complete. I think that's why. Playoff, I think the easiest way to say it is they have a more playoff effective Team, style. Yeah. Mm-hmm. San Jose gets. In. It's more you're just going to get experience for some of the like Ferraros of the world and the younger cats, the Aiden Hills of the world, yep. if he's in that for some games where Rhymer's, of course, already been in the postseason. So, like, exactly. you're just going to get some experience. But that about uh, wraps up our NHL talk, or as Pirlo would say, our full 42 on the NHL. 
Um, when it comes to going back, though, I think we should obviously wrap up uh, with talking about and previewing the following week with the NFL when it comes to the championship game. Yeah. Uh, we have the Cincinnati Bengals versus the Kansas City Chiefs, the battle of two great quarterbacks. Again, we saw Allen against Mahomes. Now we get to see Burrow against Patrick Mahomes. Similar numbers for each two, 37-13 for Patrick, 34-14 for Burrow. Um, this game is going to be interesting because obviously both have touted offenses. If I had to give the defensive rank, I'd probably have to give it to the Bengals uh, when it comes to de- definitely defense. But when it comes to like we saw, you can't give it to Mahomes at any moment on the clock, plus the Chiefs this year, um, other than last game where they, had, they didn't necessarily show it. But they have had their defense step up more than other years. This is a really tough coin flip yes. type game to pick but um i would say just due to the fact that the chiefs getting melvin ingram for pretty much nothing a six-round pick and bringing him in just like the rams were able to bring in von miller and he's becoming that dude and stepping up in the playoffs too along with the other pass rushers they have you don't need the best secondary with the chiefs don't have other than tyron matthew the honey badger if he's able to be in and, and one other cat you just need a good d line to be the Cincinnati Bengals because their offensive line is trash. So the, going by that, I feel like with the success they had against the Bills of a better offensive line, I'm going to lean towards ever so slightly by like this much. I would lean towards Kansas City because of the Mahomes effect. He's shown it longer. We've only seen Burrow for a year and a half. And then the fact that the biggest factor um, d- 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 just um, being – what I just said, which um, is the fact that I, I, I just think I, I just think when it comes to these games, it, it's going to come down to first and foremost, who's been in the experience before if it's that close. And that's why I think it's going to end up going to the chief on top of the other two things I said. Well, hmm. like the old line, I think, is going to be a big issue for the. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm going to tell you something now, okay? The, the other day was the anniversary of the 49ers and the Bengals in the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. the first Super Bowl that they were in, right? And I believe that was in 1988 or 86 or 7, one of those years. So I got to tell you, uh, watching the game with the Chiefs, um, the crowd noise affected Allen significantly, and I think that's going to be the same case with Burrow. Uh, whether that's going to affect him to a, an extent or not, because it did cost some false starts and things of that nature. And you start right. piling those up and that starts to get you going in the wrong direction and you start getting out of sync and things of that nature. If the Chiefs defense with the addition of Melvin, Melvin Ingram from the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is where he started, um, if that defense can contain Dixon, and spy Burrow so that he doesn't get outside of the pot because he can run a little bit too as well. You know what I mean? He's mobile. But I think that the main thing is this. I think the Chiefs need to keep Burrow in front of them. I think they need to play tight, like man-to-man tight, and not let guys get over the top on them. Um, And then I believe the Chiefs will be able to take this game. If they are unsuccessful in doing that, what I mean by that is this. If Cincinnati is ahead of the sticks during the game, if they're constantly getting second and four or third and two or you, you see what I mean, like second and, and three or, or, or third and two or third and three, you know, those are ahead of the sticks. Right. When, when, when you don't have this huge pressure to get a first down on third and nine or third and eight, third and seven, you know, that's behind the sticks. Right. So I, I think if if the Bengals can stay ahead of the sticks and their offensive line can step up against the pass rush against the Chiefs, then then I think Cincinnati can do it. Oh, I think they have a chance to win the game, no stretch of the imagination. I just think, like I said, it's this close. I just right. think by the fact of the line being like that, the, yeah. the Mahomes effect, the fact that they've been in this experience before, if it's a close game, they've been here and done that. The Chief, that's why I gave them the miniature knob, but it's by an ever so slight. Uh, so. I would I would have to lean Chiefs, but I'm rooting for the 
anyway, <laughs> I can't yeah. really say it. I'm not really allowed. I'm, 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 it goes against my DNA to say that I'm rooting for that team. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just saying that, um, I, I'm, I'm leaning to the chiefs, but I think the other team might take it. Yeah. Now in this other game, even though the 49ers and Kyle Shanahan have been very successful, one of the best opponents to Sean McVay has been Kyle Shanahan coaching against him, the Rams against the Niners since um, 2019, or loss, 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 loss. Um, so, but the only way that's going to happen here is if the Niners can do exactly what they did last week, which is keep a game that low on the scoring sheet, which I don't think they're going to be able to do two weeks in a row. And I don't think they're going to be able to do um, it, it as well with the way Matthew Stafford's balling out right now. The way oh, I agree, the way Cooper Cup looks. I don't. That's why I'm going to go with the Rams because their offense is to a different degree this year, and their defense is to a completely different degree. And playoff Von Miller is a completely different um, animal at that point, and is on a whole different level. So I'm going to have to go with the Rams in this one, where even though Kyle Shanahan tends to have answers for McVay. I don't think it's going to make a difference in this one just because of the talent level of both teams. See, that's kind of where I'm at, too. I think the talent level is a little bit more on the Rams side than it is for the 49ers side. Like, the reason why I would be rooting for the 49ers is because I'm kind of hoping for that nostalgic repeat of the Super Bowl. Super Bowl, Bowl yeah. You know, but in, in reality, more than likely, it's going to probably be the Rams just because I believe they have a much more complete team. Getting OBJ was, I think, a huge notch on their belt. Getting Von Miller, another huge notch on their belt. I mean, Rams were able to take the best punch of Tom Brady and picked themselves up and kicked a field goal and made Tom Brady go play golf. Yeah. So I'm going with the Rams all day on that. <laughs> yeah, so it's a close game. I'm obviously picking Matthew Stafford in tenfold over Jimmy Garoppolo yes. down the field at the end of a game. So uh, I think it's definitely Rams. But this is wrapped up. What is this, our ninth episode, Steel? Yes, it is. This is wrapped up our ninth episode of the wow. J.B. Steel show where we gave you – all the NFL stuff from recapping at the beginning to then giving you AHL, NHL talk, and then previewing at the end, the end start and end with the best of the world right now, which is the NFL football playoffs. So you can find him at SteelFlyers52 as well as SteelFlyers.com where you can find him. And, of course, Pirlo Wisdom, um, Peyton on the radio, Off the Wall Hockey John, and also Lance Green and other guests that are on there on steelflyers.com. You can find me at JJ Boric 26 on Twitter. We thank you for joining the ninth installment of the JB and steel show. Stay safe out there, everybody, and enjoy all the sports that you're watching. All right, my man. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here. Please hit the like and subscribe. We'll catch you all the next time on the JB and steel show for volume 10. Thanks guys.